Hi folks, my name is Phil and welcome to Grounded, the series which looks at airlines of yesteryear. This episode will take a look at JetTrain, a short-lived US operator not to be confused with AirTran for reasons that will become more apparent in a moment. Founded in 1994, the airline would initially be called AirTrain. In a way, they were highlighting their intentions from the off, a low-fare intercity service comparable to that of a train. The company headquarters were located in Aliquippa, Beaver County, which was on the outskirts of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and only a few miles away from the airport. Pittsburgh was a US air stronghold at the time. Way back when the airline was still known as Allegheny, it was their central hub from 1951 right up until when they rebranded as US Air in 1979. In 1987, Pittsburgh Airport set about a billion dollar expansion which saw the building of a new terminal as well as some other improvements across the airport. The increase in capacity created an opportunity for both existing and new airlines to move into the airport and AirTrain would be one such candidate to take advantage of this. AirTrain took delivery of its first aircraft in October 1995 with the arrival of a Douglas DC-9 Furter. The aircraft, November 8927 Echo, had been delivered to Eastern Airlines way back in 1967 and was already pushing 30 years old. AirTrain took to the skies in early 1996, initially operating the single DC-9 on flights between Pittsburgh and Philadelphia. It soon became apparent though that having just one aircraft was a bit risky, as should it encounter delays or worse, go tech, it would cripple the airline. A second DC-9 arrived in April. This one wasn't any younger and was also 1967 vintage. It had been delivered to ANSET down in Australia and following 15 years down under returned to the US, first with Midway Airlines and later Express One Airlines before joining AirTrain. With the introduction of the second aircraft, AirTrain could finally develop some kind of route network. The airline secured access to New York after they subleased some gates at Newark Airport from United Airlines and AirTrain also had sites on other destinations too. The airline planned to operate a route from Pittsburgh to Newark and then on to Florida. The problem was, of course, that there was an airline down there called AirTran, and the opportunities for confusion were immense. AirTran was still relatively small back then, but as they had been established first, it was AirTrain that had to rebrand. To alleviate the concerns over confusion, AirTrain rebranded to JetTrain, and this gives me an opportunity to mention their livery. It was a fairly smart design. A black nose leading into a black cheat line running along the fuselage with large jet train titles placed below the window line. The tail was black with the colour also sweeping down the rear portion of the fuselage. The company logo, an art deco design of train with golden sunburst, featured prominently on the tail as well. The airline introduced the Orlando service in April 1996 with the Pittsburgh to Newark flight continuing on to Orlando. By May 1996, JetTrain had dropped the Philadelphia flight and instead operated a twice daily service from Pittsburgh to Orlando via Newark, as well as an additional flight between Pittsburgh and Newark. Interestingly, this additional flight left Pittsburgh in the evening and returned the following morning, and was mainly due to gate access constraints. JetTrain faced increasing low fare competition on their Florida service, however. For example, Kiwi, who were covered in episode 31, were also operating from Newark to Orlando. It all came to a head towards the end of the summer. Delta Airlines had launched Delta Express, a low fare and no frills airline aimed at the leisure market. Delta Express had announced flights from Newark to Orlando launching on October the 1st. JetTrain decided to drop the route with its last flight being the day before Delta's arrival on September the 30th. JetTrain offered fares at $69 one way, which was cheaper than Delta Express's $89. However, according to a JetTrain spokesman, Jim Schwartz, Orlando was a good market for us, but I don't want to get in the middle of Delta and whoever they're going to war with. JetTrain would instead focus more on routes from Pittsburgh, with Boston and Nashville being added and Philadelphia seeing a resumption of service. To help with the growing route network, a third DC-9 joined the fleet. This one was slightly younger, being 1968 vintage and originally delivered to Eastern. The DC-9s were gas guzzlers however and fuel was becoming more expensive. Their age was also leading to mechanical delays which combined with the tiny fleet size could risk crippling the airline for days. The airline had looked at expanding out of Newark and sought to sublease three more gates from United. However, as JetTrain was securing the financing to do this deal, another carrier swooped in and took them. 
It didn't really matter though, as by the end of November 1996, Jet Train had ceased operations. So, what went wrong? Jet Train was one of many airlines to sprout up in the mid-1990s, and like the majority of those, collapsed fairly quickly, though some, like Kiwi, hung on for dear life but wouldn't see the decade out either. There are a few reasons which all combined to lead to the downfall of the airline. Jet Train had been forced to accept a low-fare approach, as there is no way it would have stood a chance taking on the long-established and much larger US Air for high-yield business traffic. The airline somewhat sensibly backed away from competition on their Orlando route, knowing that a fare war with a larger carrier would lead to the airline's quick demise. The problem was, however, that low fares didn't hold up against an increasingly costly to operate fleet of DC-9s. The aircraft were gas guzzlers and fuel costs were rising. Their age was leading to more and more maintenance costs as well. Add to that, if an aircraft encountered a maintenance delay, the knock-on could affect the airline for days, which leads to another issue, the route structure. Jet Train initially operated one aircraft on one city pairing. This was reasonably sustainable, however, once New York saw service, it began to stretch the fleet too thin. The addition of Orlando exacerbated the problem, and while management brought in two more aircraft, it was still too much of a stretch especially if there were delays, and don't forget, New York experiences a lot of weather delays come winter. I don't doubt for one minute that had Jet Train made it to winter, the harsh winter weather and subsequent delays would have finished them off. Jet Train's route structure also seemed pretty scatty, picking up and dropping routes with short notice. While this obviously wouldn't attract business travellers, it would have also deterred the leisure passenger, as after all, why book flights with an airline who might axe the route days before your trip? At a number of airports, Jet Train had been forced to sublease gates from other airlines, United at Newark and American at Nashville, for example. The problem with this was that at an airport like Newark, the gate would have been very much in demand by United's own services, and thus, Jet Train found itself being forced to operate at less than ideal times, further making it difficult to attract high yield business passengers. This problem affected a lot of new airlines as aviation deregulation made its way around the world. The larger incumbent carriers controlled the majority of gates and therefore access to airports, but at least it didn't reach Australian levels of stifling the competition. Thanks for watching. If you have any comments, suggestions or criticisms, please do get in touch. If you don't have a YouTube doodah, don't worry. I've got a contact form on my website and I'm also on Facebook and Twitter. I've got plenty more episodes in the works, so if you haven't already, why not subscribe to catch them as they land? And as always, thanks for watching.